Okay. Ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, thank you for, for being here. So thank you, uh, James, for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Freddy from Accenture Labs. I'm also representing uh, Inria uh, in France. Uh, so both have research and industry uh, uh, background. And the work I'm presenting is the work I've been doing uh, with Accenture Labs. Uh, so Accenture, just quick introductions. Uh, Accenture Labs is a research and development division of Accenture. It's, it's, not big, uh, it's not a big department, it's 200 people globally. And uh, I'm based in Dublin, we have 15 people, and we're mainly working on um, what I'm going to present now on explainable AI. Uh, it's getting quite odd topic now in the AI space and the, um, in the interpretability uh, domain. So how you can uh, build systems or machine learning models that you can interpret. And um, it, there's a big hype now on deep learnings and so deep neural networks. Uh, it's very nice tooling for doing predictions, building models, uh, but it's very seen as a black box. And, and can we do something with it to interpret the decision they're making or the pattern they're defining? So you can still uh, tune the parameters in it, but it's, it's still very difficult for a person to interpret the the decision that the machine is doing. And, and that's what's an example of one machine learning approach. We try to, call, to work across many different approaches. So what I'm going to present, just give you on where explainable AI makes sense and kind of what kind of industry, uh, and then explain more details what, what is it, and then uh, relate to the problem that we have with our clients. Uh, so um, for, for those that who don't, who don't know, Accenture is a service company, so we don't really have any products. Uh, we basically build services for those companies. Um, and a lot of those companies have problems and, and they want to have an um, explainable system for them. So I'll go through three applications we did with three different clients uh, that I can't name, but uh, you, you can see the, the variety of the industry uh, you can apply those approaches. So. So I'll start first with the, with the motivations. So that's, um, so what you see is a, is a bunch of different um, kind of small industry or domains uh, that um, all of us in some way operating in. So it could be much more in the consumer space, in the professional space, in the enterprise space, or industrial and military. And, um, and you have cost of, if you do a poor decisions, I mean, Spiros mentioned in the care domain, if you do a poor decision, it may have a huge impact on, on, on people, right? So, uh, so, so that's an example where uh, if you do a poor decision, the cost is very, very high, and, um, and you need to be careful about what you're doing, what you're recommending, and how you keep tracking information. So that's very important. And then you have the thing on the human participations. Do you need a human to be in the loop to, to take any decisions. And again, in Spiro's case, uh, you need the human in the loop because they, they need to validate any claim that the system is, is capturing when they interact with the models. And um, as, op as, supposed, uh, as opposed to that, in the industrial and military space, uh, you don't need ma that, many, that much human in participations. Um, so smart weapons are detecting um, um, threats on, on, uh, on the ground in different territory. Um, and, and that's something that's been quite uh, highly automated. And, uh, and taking always human feedback is not something that they usually do. So they, they, they have quite a few um, uh, expertise in the field. But if you take a poor decision, it has a huge impact. Um, so... <coughs> And in terms of explainable AI, um, why I do have this category of military is because the DARPA, so which is the <coughs> one of the U.S. Uh, defense um, uh, funding for in, in the U.S., uh, they, they bring a lot of uh, funding money for this particular field. So they that's where the so basically in the U.S. the explainability or the explainable AI is coming to get, get a lot of traction because of the DARPA, and, and in Europe it's because of the GDPR. Uh, which will come on, on action in May 2018. So basically the right to explanations when the system making decisions. Any of us in the room, if a bank or if whatever parties take a decisions about your data and they use your data and say, oh, you can't have a mortgage, well, you can come back to them and say, okay, why, why, why did you end up not giving me the mortgage? And any other, any other context uh, in, where they use your data for making a decisions, 
from May 2018, you can go back and say, why did you end up with this solution? So that's why it is the GDPR get, it will get a big, a big impact in the, in the European um, domain. So, yeah, so it's just to positions where things, explainable AI makes sense. And, and most of the things is on the right hand side and, and on the top. So that's where we focus. We focus on the enterprise side. So when you detect a fraud, uh, can you explain why is that a fraud? Uh, can, when you do credit risk profiling, uh, when we discuss with um, um, uh, banks or, or mortgage-related companies, uh, they, they want to have this capability of explaining. Uh, they, they have rules. Sometimes they use machine learning. Rules is much more easy to explain. Uh, but some, they use much more now, um, <coughs> uh, much more efficient approaches, but less interpretable, and they need systems that could explain and interpret them. And many medical diagnosis, it's something, again, that the human can do and they can explain, uh, but the more we're progressing and we see the different, uh, various um, um, progress in the field from different large companies and uh, medical centers, uh, it's much more and more automated over time. And uh, you still need the, uh, an expert to interpret the decisions uh, that are done. So, so to, just to give you a bit of background on the different industries, so it's really touching anything uh, with, with different level of, of impact. So now I'll discuss what's, what's explainable AI, and later on I'll connect with the connected data. So then you can make the glue on how connected data, knowledge graph, semantic web, can help in solving those, those particular problems. And it's one way, some other people might not use this particular approach, but it's, it's, a, it, it's, been, um, it's getting a lot of traction now. Uh, so, so you start from some patterns on the left hand side, it could be anything, any kind of data, and then you have this black box which is in blue, and you can do supervised learning and supervised learning depending if you have labeling data, label data or not, and uh, then if you, um, you, can have, you can do classification, regressions, and you have many different techniques. And that's all example of techniques, a set of neural nets, decision trees. They overlap to some extent in some ways. So they're just example of machine learning techniques. Uh, decision trees is probably the simplest and the most if, one, one of the most efficient approach and very easily interpretable. Uh, but, um, but the more and the more data we get and the, the less efficient they are, and then slightly people moving to the deep learning, I mean, especially in video and image processing, but a lot in, uh, in natural, uh, natural text processing, right? So, <clears throat> so you have those, those techniques, they can do classification, uh, regression, and, um, and depending on which techniques you apply, uh, you have different level of accuracy. So if you try different techniques, usually if you talk to machine learning experts, they just try to, try to do, it, do any kind of assembling of techniques. And well, they don't really care about the interpreter. They can combine different techniques. Um, and they try to reach the best accuracy and try to avoid overfitting and try to generalize as the best. This is what they really care. So in the end, because it, you, they don't only apply one particular simple model, it's, 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 a, it's a mess. If you go to Kaggle, look at the best models. They're all ensembles. They're all very complex models for most of the time. Uh, even if sometimes they use one, one simple model working nicely, the best one is a very complex and ensemble model. Um, and explainability, depending on the model, the further you go on the right, the more explainable you are, but as you can see, the, the highly explainable, like decision trees, they're not as good as the, <coughs> as the, as the other model which, which perform the best. So, so, so then you end up with those models with, with a model, and then you say, okay, I want to predict, um, can I have my mortgage, or um, uh, recommending a movies, or, so d depending on what you want to do. And then you get the scores, or this is what I recommend to you, uh, this is why I think this is a fraud, uh, this is what we think it's uh, an abnormal pattern that we could, uh, we, could, uh, we could detect and need to do something, but that's the score. And, um, when we discuss with our clients, the main thing they ask is say, it's great to get a high score, but could you give me the reason behind? And that, that's, that's, that's where we, we start taking and say, well, well yeah, that, 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 that's based on the data, that's based on your data, on historical data. And uh, people start thinking, okay, all right, it's based on my historical data, you should be able to explain it to me. Uh, but it's, it's messy patterns, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to explain and interpret. So, so then what the human wants, they want to know if it's good, uh, what did you get that, 
uh, how did you get this particular result? Why not actually something else? So people are very interested in contrasting things. So you give me this result with this score, um, and why is not something else as a result? Uh, I was expecting something else. Um, so when do you succeed? So when is the success part? When do you fail? How can I trust you? When can I trust you? How do I correct an error? So if there's something wrong, and um, uh, what did you do? What did you do this way? So it's kind of questions that you may have, and it's uh, and I mean we all experts in some technical fields, so it make uh, doesn't really make so much sense for technical experts answering those questions uh, because we we trust the machines, we know how they're doing things mathematically, and they, there are models behind. Uh, but then when you talk to those uh, business persons, they come up with those questions. And that's the one that put the money on the table, and the one that makes the decisions, and then the one that needs to, uh, uh, to be convinced. And they'd say, if you want us to move to this AI wave, that's kind of things uh, uh, we need to answer. And so that's, that's the main concern. Um, so, so I move to the problem statement, and we'll start thinking about how you connect data. And, uh, so, so when you think about uh, explaining things, uh, at, at the end of the day, you have a set of data. And most of the time, the data is temporary. I mean, in our context, in the case we studied, the, the data is changing over time. Um, you, you may have um, information about a mortgage history of persons and the information about the persons, the kind of the, the, the things they bought or the things they, they sell or, or whatever the information. The person, the, person uh, the, the life, the, the time is impacting what, whatever they're doing. And uh, so you need to keep tracking these evolutions. And basically these evolutions has some impact on some of the decisions. So you end up with a lot of signals for particular, for particular, in particular domains. And you, in the end of the day, you want to find a correlation across a different time and why it might be an impact. Uh, so if I go back to the mortgage example, which is a very simple one, but um, <clears throat> you want to understand what might be an, have been an impact in terms of your history of credits that could have an impact on the mortgage. And, uh, and again, the banks, they analyze the data, they have some rules, and they apply uh, them on this. And it's, it's all based on temporal evolutions to somehow, and, and you can apply it to many other contexts. So they basically do some kind of simple correlations, and um, but the end of the goal is really to find actually causation. So correlation and causation is different. Correlation is just finding some evidence that there's some, some data that correlate over time and that may have some impact on some decisions, but causation is really give you that, oh, we know this is the cause for it. And, and, they, and they, every, most of the people, they're confused about the, the disjoint of those two parts. So that's how you transform a correlation in a causation, and how basically this causation is the explanation. And uh, so you get a lot of, lot, a lot of signals, lots of external data, and then how you basically uh, build these causations. And, uh, that's where knowledge graph, connected data coming in play, because in a graph, you start connecting together and you, you have some kind of uh, relationship and then you can interpret information and you can use it somehow to support the causation part uh, because you, have, you may use some reasoning, lightweight reasoning techniques over the graph. Um, so, so what I'll do now is I move to different um, example of application with it. Um, I'll move maybe one slide on the technical, very technical part, uh, but show the work we did in the explainable AI context in three different industries. Uh, so two are with two different clients, and one is an internal project we did for Accenture. Um, so I'll start with the with the first one on. Um, on, tr on expenses in, in, in Accenture. So, um, so if you look at the, um, at the large companies, actually any companies, they, they, they spend things on items, they, pay, they spend money on people, they spend, they, they spend money on different things, on travel, and so on. And, um, and they usually have rules for saying, can I buy this, can I travel to this event, and they and they, they apply they apply those rules, and it's called the compliance part. So they have compliance rules. Everybody needs to be compliant with it. Everything's fine. Everything's good. 
uh, but they, it's rules of things defined beforehand long time ago and things changing now. And, uh, and the, the compliance getting a bit more fuzzy. So you have things which actually should be compliant, but with a, with a, with a cap slightly higher depending on the context. And they say and we need to move away from this uh, simply because the, the way we operate is not as static as it was. And we need to find a way of uh, optimize the spending. So being more, uh, more flexible, and, uh, and that, that's the, that's the game-changing part, is not only on how you detect compliance and non-compliance, it's, it's not an easy problem, but it's, they want to move away from here and move the compliance rules slightly flexible on the way and learn from the data, learn from what people are doing, rather than just saying, that's my basic information, let's apply it and let's do it. So let's just learn from what people are doing, learn the best practices on the fly. So policy is basically you try to learn policies. Uh, so that's the overall context. Maybe look a bit fluffy and I'll go a bit, I'll go a bit more in details on uh, an, an approach. So that's, uh, that's uh, an example of uh, the data we use for in Accenture explaining abnormal travel expenses. So Accenture is a service company. They're sending, they're basically sending a lot of people to client sites. It could be from one city to another one, could be a local one, could be an international one. A lot, most of the people traveling in the company. And um, so a lot of the, a lot of the cost for the company is, is then people and then the travel expenses they're doing. And they, again, they have those basic rules that say what I should apply for uh, getting um, in the budget. Um, but again, you have some frauds. It's not easy to detect. You have abnormal patterns about expenses. And then you have things that just uh, ask. This seems compliant. They are compliant, but actually they, 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 are, they, they are out of the, out of the normal. So then how you detect the normal, and then how you can detect those abnormal patterns, which are compliant, but uh, they, 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 they basically don't want to get rid of them. So, so what we get is we, get, we, we just say, okay, let's, let's try to use data we have about, uh, about our employees. So what we use is just use half of the population of Accenture. We got access to all of their, all of their expenses in 2015. We just reduced to uh, 620 cities, to people who are traveling, to the major cities in the world. And that gives you the first, the first rule. So uh, all expenses, you try to detect abnormal travel expenses. It's all CVV file, um, and you have the detailed information here. Uh, it's not super huge, it's just what people report when they want to get their money back. Uh, so this is the data we have. Um, and then you want to say, well, what could be the explanation for it uh, if you find an abnormal expense? Uh, and then you say, well, maybe there's something going on in the city that might impact travel, uh, travel expenses. And then you start um, aggregating and connecting more data about uh, social media events, music events. And again, that's the data we, we use, the, the existing APIs for collecting this data and just to understand the dynamic of the city. So you can get this external data easily. And you have media news, um, Event, um, <clears throat> I can send you the details about the, which, which kind of data, uh, the, where the data source is coming. All the three are all public and open, and you can easily access it. And, and then you have some semantics. So we just want to, uh, we build a very small schema. Uh, I won't call it a non ontology because it's a very light way. But just like um, a, a core schema of the representation of our expense and potential explanations. And we build some potential causation link, but a potential that means it's potential explanations and causation link, uh, but we still need to learn it from the data. And uh, that's where the semantic is helping is making the glue between the different pieces and components. So at some point, you will see a graph where all things are glued together. Um, so this is, uh, this is the semantic part. And you have the special part, uh, but it's not really relevant. It's just for, for uh, showcasing uh, results. So, um, um, okay, so that's the technical slide. Uh, try to not spend much time on it. Uh, so, um, I'll, 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 I'll skip it and move. Well, no, I give a glance of it. So, a bunch, large, large amount of expenses. Oh, each and every expense, they have about 25 dimensions for so the city, what's the travel, what's the expense type. Uh, with whom you traveled, who was the client, and so on. And basically, you want to, and for some cases, you have some, um, 
um, some level of uh, um, you, you try to do uh, to to classify which expense might be might be risky or might be um, an abnormal expense or non-expense, uh, not abnormal expense. So you try to basically cluster those expenses and find which ones are similar each other. So, it, so it's, it's, it's a pure, it's a pure clustering technique here. Uh, all right, five minutes. Okay. Okay. So I five minutes. So I definitely okay. Uh, move here. Here is the graph that we have. Uh, so we 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 have the travel. We have the people ID, the expense type. Uh, and um, they all in different systems. They, we have some join uh, primary key that, that and foreign key that share the different tables. Uh, so we, we build the core the, the core schema that was in the graph, and the, and then we expand it with what I, you mentioned, I mentioned before about external events um, and potential causations, and that's all integrated in a graph. And I think you see in yellow is the external data we had, so even full Wikipedia. Uh, factual data with information about restaurant and time and expense. And, and then basically we, we learn a, a, a learning um, algorithm on top of the graph to, to learn rules, to detect when, uh, what, what's, what's, what's derived a high abnormal expense. And then you end up with such rules and you learn rules and you have, you have many of them that are learned over the graph. Um, okay, so given a bit short in time, uh, uh, so, so this is the overall architecture. Uh, so, so we process the data, we uplift it with the graph, and then you try to find, um, we have reasoning mechanism on the graph to explain how things are done. Um, so this is the, uh, well, I'm, I'm, so I, I won't show the demo, but this is the screenshot of what we have. You pick, you pick a particular location in the city, in a particular location in the world, you see expenses. This is, you see a heat map in San Francisco. Uh, someone pick a particular expense of a particular person. The second string is a potential explanation category. So if you try to detect if it's a fraud, uh, if it's an external event imp impacting maybe the, impacting the expense type, uh, it's an internal event, and you have different categories. And those categories, they're coming from the graph. So they're just extracted and, and presenting this way. And each category, they have subtypes. And uh, so you, for an external event, you have, may have music and business and different type of events. And, you, and what you get in the end is a tool that the auditors can use for identifying where are my abnormal expenses and why might be the potential explanations. So they won't use this UI, this UI was for showcasing, but they use the functionality behind for getting what are the most likely explanations and then do they need to go back to the employee and say, um, is it an abnormal expenses or not? And you have a lot of those email exchange. Um, <coughs> and you can, you can also do it for predictions um, and, and explaining the predictions. And that, that's the graph part. Uh, uh, I'll move the experimentations. I'll ju we just, um, I just wanted to move to, the do, to other cases. Um, but basically, the previous slide mentioned a few experimentation. We tried different level of explicitity of the semantic we used to see how it did impact the, the explanation part. On the air industry, what we try to do is um, explaining. Um, so what they have very quickly is uh, they have a problem of ripple effect. If you have delay on the flight early in the morning on an aircraft, um, mo most of the airline companies we discuss with, they want to know doesn't have, doesn't have the um, a ripple effect on the last one, so that they, they need to adjust and get a new aircraft ready, uh, because it, I mean, the, um, they, they want to make sure that everybody is get, on, um, get, get their flight on time and to avoid really compensation, compensations, and, and that's what they call the ripple effect and understand the sequence. So, so we build this system, again, using external data, about weather information, the airport context, the city, and so on and uh, try to uh, predict the flight delays at the very last leg using the sequence of flights. So we use a um, LSTM or Recurrent Neural Network based uh, machine learning models where we inject semantics uh, for detecting the explanation. Um, so that's the second case. Um, and this uh, should be another one, yeah. And, and this one, this is another application we did uh, in Accenture is try to predict the risk of contract we're doing with our clients. I'm doing in time. Um, okay, cool. 
Okay, so uh, so on this one, uh, Accenture uh, on on average gets 34,000 30, new contracts per year. Uh, the contracts signed by with our clients, and as any company, when you do something like that, uh, some contract maybe up to five million for 10 years, and more than five millions, and there are a large number of contracts. And you need a team that mitigates and manage the risk of those contracts. And some contracts will completely fail uh, because we, we, we may not have the right person, so the right team in place in the right moment. That's a new industry you're doing. Uh, that's a new clients we're just getting in play. And, uh, and there's a team dedicated to find and make sure that what, what are the risks of those projects. Um, and because there's a huge number of contracts, they can manage each of them. So they just manage a, a, a small portion of it and say, oh, can we use machine learning about our historical data and try to uh, predict uh, what would be the risk of our contract? And again, yes, you can use machine learning. This is what we did. We tried different system. We did some learning. And we ended up with a good system with 86% accuracy. Give me a contract. We'll tell you if we're going to make revenue or lose revenue on this one. This is what we get. We we'll say, OK, we have it. And they say, okay, well, I need to understand it. And they say, all oh, right, uh, we don't really have any explanation. It's based on the data, there are some patterns. And they say, okay, I need, I need to find an explanation. So if you want us to use it in the company that generate the well, actually, this is the basis for our revenue generation, we need to understand the reason why. I mean, there's a huge impact. So, but then we went back and then um, and tried to uh, change the model, change the system, um, injecting more data. and. And we build what we call a quality model ontology, um, which is kind of a risk-related ontology for this particular for this particular part, and try to embed it in the in the machine learning approach. So I won't detail the technical details uh, here, but in the end, you get explanations um, and you can compare contracts across. Uh, this is what what they aim at, and then you can also have the user feedback and saying, I don't think this contract might be risky, and um, then they can give feedback, and, and we have a, a, a part that that keep learning um, <coughs> on the user feedback given. Okay, so 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 that's uh, that's 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 basically it. Um, um, so okay, so so we we focus on explainable AI. We apply a lot of semantics and try to combine it with machine learning. Uh, so we have different techniques. Uh, uh, we get some uh, some publications. Uh, so some of the ap approach are I may have been made. Uh, we, we describe the technical uh, the technical approach on how how we combine the two. Um, so it, it's um, it's available, and some of them we, we just don't uh, for for IP related issues. Um, and uh, and we apply it to in airline and risk management and travel, and we have many more coming now. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm based in Dublin, um, and uh, it's the hub for innovation for Accenture. We have a lot of people coming with interesting questions on how you can explain decisions. Um, and, and we really try to combine the two, the, the semantic and the machine learning uh, domain together. So yeah, so I'll, stop, I'll stop now, uh, give time for questions. Big thanks to Freddie, really interesting talk. <laughs> Time for a couple of minutes of questions. Do we have any on? Hi, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. So I have a question on your uh, some, uh, architecture slide um, with regards to the semantic matching and what is the underlying platform when you're doing this integration of semantics and the actual data you're using for machine learning? So you mean how we how we you you link the data to the machine learning? Yeah, what is the underlying platform when you do this integration? Uh, so it's an how in-house platform. There's no really system that will allow you to um, well capture semantic facts as input of a machine learning model. So we um, so we build a in-house solution to to basically. Get the data, ex exp uh, expand it as a graph. I mean, it's it's a well-known approach to how you uplift the data, and then how you you use our techniques, uh, how you use existing machine learning approach. So an example is a random forest, uh, or decision trees. They take as input raw data. So we we expanded the data 
with some label and some kind of graph structure, and, um, and the machine learning is taking in con consideration this particular structure. I don't think there's much work out there. We don't really use any, if there is any, we don't really use those techniques. We just, they are in-house techniques. Uh, but, but you have other approaches that, that try to, uh, to combine the two, but there's no industrial platforms or anything available at, at the moment on, on, on doing machine learning. Well, we have something on machine learning on, on graph, but it's, it's not that mature yet, as far as I know. So it's basically about enriching the actual machine learning data with the semantics yeah. you get, okay. Oh, we try different ways, so that's one way, and the other way is you, you try, an approach we're doing now, it's in a, in a neural network, uh, you try to embed semantics on layers, or you try to group um, neurons or layers together and add some semantics. So it's well known in video processing that the further you go on the neural network, the more concrete is the pictures. And the, at the beginning, it's only edges, it's detecting, and over time, over the, over the network, you have more information. So we're starting from here and say, well, if they can do it on the images, can we uh, try to, I mean, um, annotate those parts of neurons ones and group them. So this is an approach we're doing now. We haven't applied it yet. So that's, that's some kind of work we're doing with, with one university in the US. Uh, Thanks. Hi, Freddie. Uh, great talk. Um, I just didn't get how you evaluate the quality of your explanations. How do you know that your explanations are any good? Are you doing user testing or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we, we so we did user testing, um, uh, particularly in the risk uh, context. So when they try to when we get an explanation, uh, the explanation we get is a something. Uh, so we don't. Well, let me position it properly. So we don't really explain. We don't really explain why you are risky. Uh, we explain why uh, you are not risky. And the users, what they're doing, we give them the chance to compare on um, how this particular contract it might be in this class. So um, if you get a class of risky contract, you get the main characteristics of these uh, risky deals, right? And, uh, and then you can say, what are the main characteristics? It might be some you know, pricing structures, location of some people, and say, okay, let me, let me see and compare them. And then they may say, it doesn't or it don't make sense, and they compare against other classes. And um, so we let the user find if the, the, the explanation is right. So we let them basically go through the explanation, rather than let them, because there's no really grand truth about what's the explanation. So that, that's a tricky problem. So that's where we let the user investigate a bit the search, and that's where they give the user feedback. And we try to use this feedback then to further refine the explanation level. Um, so that's, that's, the way, that's the way we do it. Okay. Um, thanks for that. We're, we're um, running a little bit short on time, but I'd, I'd suggest Freddie, Freddie's around for the whole day, so if anyone has any uh, other questions, by all means, uh, grab them during, during the break. Big thanks to Freddie. Really, really interesting talk. <laughs>